No? 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 There's some seats in the front. Do you want to move up front? Yeah, come on inside the tent, maybe. It'll work. I, don't, I can't throw my, my uh, voice to the woods. It's not going to work. I like this. Can you hear me back there? Black shirt, yeah? No? All right. I haven't done this before. This is, good. Yeah. This is how I speak with my sponsees one on one. You! You! I figure if you speak loud enough, they'll get it. But maybe I just do it this way. All right, Paul, alcoholic, we'll do, I'll uh, just mostly stick with AA. Can you hear me now, yeah? Yes? Yeah, all right. So in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, they talk about the root of the disease is obsession with self. So it says, uh, and in those two pages that it talks about the obsession with self, this, it says this self-centeredness will kill us, we have to get rid of it at all costs, but we find out that no human power can basically do that. Yeah? So, in my view, it's a little bit different. I don't believe the root of the problem is obsession with self. I believe obsession with self is a mind's activity that reinforces the root of the problem, which is identification as self. It's a little bit different than obsession with self, because I'll use an example. I uh, used it last night. I was, uh, I really, really was obsessed with Coke, yeah, when I was out there. But I never became Coke, yeah. I never crossed the line. Anytime I was doing Coke, there was a sort of a separation between me and the Coke. Yeah? No matter how much obsessed I got with it, I never sort of moved into a bindle and <laughs> this and that. That didn't occur. I didn't take myself to be Coke. And, uh, and, but it was an extreme obsession. I've never been obsessed with anything more in my life than that drug. But, and there's like movies where they'll show like a woman who gets obsessed with a starlet, and she wants to be like the starlet, and then it's like horror movies usually. And she starts <laughs> trying to go out with the, the, the starlet's boyfriends, and then when they don't seem to uh, want to go out with her, she kills the boyfriends, she kills everyone near the starlet, She's dressing like the starlet, and basically she ends up killing the starlet. And so the obsession has gone so far where she wants to be identified as the starlet, yeah? And it seems to be very, very extreme, but I believe many of us, many of us are suffering from that state of mind. And obsession went way past the point of obsession, and we're identified as self, yeah? In other words, we're identified with how the mind presents us, yeah? When it's talking about us, that us is feeling of being a long-lasting, independent, separate entity, a body, so to speak, yes? And so, this obsession, I feel, has crossed, it didn't cross a line, I believe the identification was in place already. And the obsession is how it reinforces the identification. Because the identification, like in the book, it says, please relieve us of the bondage to self. What is that bondage to self, yeah? For something to be bonded, it has to be something else. Yeah? So when you bond something to some, when you bond something to something, they're both different in a way. Yeah. So you need like a gluing agent so that you can bond it so it will stick to that thing you're bonding to. Yes. So in the book it says, "Please relieve us of the bondage to self." So we're not actually self. Yeah. We're something you can't put a name on, but we. Bond, we're, we're bonded to self, and I believe the bond is actually the identification, and the obsession of self is, is the uh, reapplication of glue every day, yeah? So your head, like K-Paul, that radio station you're plugged into, is playing all your golden oldies every day, yeah? Everything is going around, and it's all about you, yeah? <laughs> And there's a lot of commercials. It's trying to sell you a plan on how you'll be happy, whatever. But so that is by listening to that, that's sort of like the daily application of the glue that bonds us to self. Yeah. 
but we're not self, and that's really the solution. The solution is we're not self, because the bonding, ha the bonding has an effect, but when you're already identified as it, all it does is strengthen an, an already present effect. We're, qu we're trying to question that present effect. If there's been a line that has been crossed that it is an obsession, but it's identification as, then we're already bonded to the idea of being self. And then the application of the, of the glue can either seem to be tighter or looser every day, yes? So some days you're doing better so the glue doesn't have such a hold. Other days you're super glued to it, yeah? But there is a prior glueness to it already because you're identified as it. And if you're identified as a self, no matter how bad being a self gets, you cannot entertain being free of it. Because you have taken yourself to be it, yes? The mind cannot entertain being free of it. At some people's lives, it finally entertains being free of it by taking their own lives. They shoot themselves or something, yes? And that's the only way it seems like I can be free of it, is if I end. Because this, this view comes from the identification. Because when you're identified, let's say alcoholism is a, like a parasite, yeah? And if you've been taken over by the parasite of alcoholism, you know its qualities, are, its takeover is hostile, yes? It, it's not very good for the host. It really isn't. The host really, really does very badly under the occupation of the parasite of alcoholism. So, for this parasite to keep the host, it seems to have, it has to have a damn good strategy. And I believe its strategy is that it presents an idea of you, and then you become identified as that idea, and that idea is the parasite. Yeah? So now, no matter how bad it gets, the, maybe the best thing you can come up with is, I'll get therapy for it. Yeah? Or I'll have to go into a program to get socialized. Or I'll have to learn how to manage anger and stuff. Yeah, all this stuff. But you can't entertain being free of it because you're identified as it. Yeah? The mind can't go there. It cannot break that one bond. Well, the one bond of identification is that you're it. No matter how hostile it gets, it basically tries to improve it or win it over or make deals with it. it tried, you try to negotiate with it. Yes? <laughs> but it's a nasty parasite. It's not changing its stripes, yes? It has you as a host. And if you've seen alcoholics, you've got to see that it's a parasite because it doesn't let the alcoholic die very quickly, yeah? I've seen alcoholics, they've been on the streets in San Francisco for 20 years. They got limps, abscesses, no teeth, but they're still kicking, yeah? They just can't die because the parasite only has this one host. <laughs> and I, I realize it's a horrible death for most alcoholics. They don't go overnight while they're sleeping. They tend to go on and on and on and on and on. So when I entertain the idea that it was an obsession with self, that it was maybe identif I'm identified as this idea called Paul, then as soon as I entertain that, I can entertain being free of it, radically free of it, not getting a little space from it, yes, not having vacations from it, but always going back to it, but actually being free of it. And so, when you're free of it, what happens is, its effects diminish in your life, yeah? It's like a tentacles. Yet, there was a movie, in a, a, a horror movie in Thailand called Shut Up, where this guy and his friends did this terrible thing for this woman, and they were, he was taking pictures of it when they were killing her or something, yeah? And then, he's a photographer, and her spirit comes back, and he starts fucking with his life. And then one day he's going crazy in his little studio and he drops a Polaroid on the ground and it just takes a picture of, the, of, of him, right, from a distance. And what it pictures is, in the Polaroid you see this Thai woman sitting on his shoulders just grabbing his head. Yeah? That's what the parasite is like. You, there's something that's taking you over and it's like this. And everything that's thought, everything that's felt, it's tentacles, check it out first. <laughs> I know this, I know this, I know this. And so basically, your life is not being lived by you. You're just a form of transportation. <laughs> 
and the incredible thing, read the book, read the big book. It says it on page 64, being convinced, which means to believe with certainty, <laughs> I feel like I'm in a, like a dinner club. It's, really, it's, it's pretty good. He has a golden oldie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> but it says in the book, page 64, being convinced, which means to believe with certainty, that self manifested in various ways. So the word manifest means it appears, yes, in various ways. So self manifested in various ways is what has defeated us. Yeah. So you can see he's made a difference. Yeah. Us and self are two different things. Yeah. Us have been defeated by self. Now if we ask everyone in this room what self defeated them, they'd all come up with the same answer. Myself and what? Yeah. My self, this self doesn't, have, doesn't seem to have defeated you, but myself, the one that your mind is identified as, is what has defeated you. So it's not self that can defeat you, it's your identification as self that sets you up to be defeated. Yeah. Self doesn't defeat you, but my self defeats you. The my means you're identified as it. This is me. This is myself. When you become identified as self, it has the power to fuck your life up. When you're not, I, just like when someone comes over your house and they're talking about selfing to you, yeah? Don't you seem to have an immunity to it? You, know, you can be like Solomon. You can give them great wisdom about their selfing. Because there's sort of an immunity because it's not yours, yeah? But you can have the same thoughts, and if they're held as your thoughts, that exact same going through the other person's heads, you'll be totally fucked up by it. They're the same thoughts, but one person is taking them to be theirs, and when they're sharing them, you're not taking them to be yours, and then you're sitting there taking them to be yours, and they have the power to defeat you. That is, to me, the activity of the root of the disease, is the act of being identified as something that you're not. So it says, all right, being convinced that self manifested in various ways is what has defeated us, we will now look at its, meaning self's, common manifestations. And the next paragraph in the book starts out with resentment. Yes? So we, when we're doing an inventory, you may want to look at it in this light, where I'm actually doing an inventory of self's expressions through my life. Yeah? And if there's a whole lot of expressions of self in your life, guess what? There must be an identification as self to have so much uh, carte blanche entrance into your life, into your relationships, into this, into that, yes? Because every time self appears, you never check its papers. You just call it you. <laughs> so, here, self is what has defeated me. Let's look at resentments, fear, and harming other peoples. If you look at it in this light, those are expressions of self. It's almost like you're looking at a foreign installment, and you're seeing how it expresses when it has you. What would happen if it didn't have you? It would have no way to access into life. You can study self. It doesn't seem to kick your ass at all. But when it's yourself, it sure does. Yeah. So it isn't self that defeated me. It's the my, it's the being identified as self that defeats me. Yeah. That's, that is what allows it access for the, to defeat me. It doesn't have access until I become identified. Now it has total access because I'm identified as it. And you'll hear people, when they talk about fear, how do they frame it? My fear. When they talk about resentments, my resentments. When they talk about what I did, they were my actions. And yet, they, in a sense, if you read the first step, it says you're powerless over alcohol. It's like, you're going to stop dancing with a gorilla when it wants to stop dancing. Yeah? You had no say in the matter. The parasite had you, and now it's been using you to express itself through And we're the consequences of that. And we'll keep being the consequences of that if we keep identifying as it. You're not going to be... Self cannot get out of self. 
It's a statement they use in AA all the time. How can self get out of self? If, let's say, you're going to study two years, a two-year course on the obsession with self, yes? And you're identified as self, that studying two years about the obsession with self is obsession with self. So the more you study to get out, the more you're in. The more knowledge you have about it, like in AA it says, self-knowledge avails us nothing. To me, any knowledge claimed by self avails you nothing because it doesn't lead you to freedom from self. The self neuters the knowledge because you're, you're taking the knowledge in as a self. <laughs> You'll never get the pointer. You always think, oh, that's self that's defeating me. You don't realize. It's like having a cold and thinking it's the flu, and you religiously go out and buy $200 worth of flu medicine. You take it every day and every night, and, you know, you get a little relief because the cold and flu have similar symptoms, but you never get a lasting relief because you're misdiagnosed. You don't have the flu. You've got a cold. Yeah? It's not obsession with self, it's identification as self. I have confidence in sharing it because I entertained it and I've had long-lasting relief from the occupation of self. <laughs> That's all the proof I needed. I don't need to have a belief. I don't have faith in it. I know. Yes? It translates here. To me, I call it, a, on a broad level, a traveling lighter. Yeah. You just start traveling lighter. It doesn't change the geography of your life, but you travel lighter over it. Yeah? What's going to come your way may come your way, but you'll travel lighter over it. It's not so much, it's not an experience, it's more of a state. Yeah? And yet that state gives meaning, new meaning, to your experiences. Yeah? There's an old, there's a book called The Course in Miracles. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Well, in The Course in Miracles, one of its major um, point is, is that you and I give everything all the meaning it has. Yeah? That's what we do in life. When I'm living life, I'm giving it the meaning it has for me. Yes? So when I see something, I don't actually see something. Yeah? I see my ideas about it. Yeah? What happens is, meaning is given to that. And let's just say... A center of distrib distribution of meaning could be self, yes? And we've had plenty of its products. When self is identified as you, then it's giving your life the meaning it has. And you're reacting to its meaning. Have you ever had a feeling that sometimes you realize you don't want what you want? It's totally different. The agenda that's been running in your head doesn't even match what you really like and stuff because something is taking you over. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, there's a part of the book that's really important, the third step, yeah? Probably the biggest principle of AA is to turn your will and your life over to the care of something else, yes? Greater than self. That's how it's said. Yeah, beautiful, isn't it? You, you turn your will, your will in your life over to a power greater than self. Yeah. And then, uh, but you would say that's the biggest principle. But prior to that principle, it says the how and why of it. Yeah? The how and why of the whole program. I'm going to stand up so you can see. Really? I can dance a little too. <laughs> any any uh, requests out there? <laughs> So the how and why of it, which is a pretty comprehensive view of something, yeah? If you're going to say, hey, listen, this is the how and why of something, yeah, it's a pretty big point. So it says, the how and why of the whole program is to quit playing God. It doesn't work. And then it says, next, in this drama of life, God's going to be our director, yeah? So there's something that precedes the third step that goes unnoticed quite a lot, which is the statement... To quit playing God, it doesn't work. Yeah? So let's say if the identification as self is what plays God, yeah. and it's using your like God-like juice to do it, when you're identified as self and you go to the third step, who's doing who is surrendering your will and life over? Self, yes? 
That's why you have the experience that you think you can take it back all the time. Yeah? Because the God of your understanding, if you're identified as self, is a smaller God than that self. So when you give your... I, a lot of people I know in the program, this is an experience they have. Oh, I had surrendered, but I've taken it back. And then I got my ass kicked and I surrendered again, only to take it back. It's like you gave some candy to a little kid and you're the bully and you just ran it back. All right, fuck you. Fuck you, God. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> yes? Kick them too, you know what I mean? <laughs> so if, in a sense, if there's the identification of self and you do the third step from that, yes? What you, you have now surrendered your will and life over to the care of something greater than self of self's understanding. Which, uh, in self's understanding, there's nothing greater than self. <laughs> so, you give it over to a very weak God, which you can take back at any time. But can you imagine, if you could entertain, I'm going to turn my will light and life over to a God of its own understanding. God's understanding, yes? Not yours, not mine, but God's. Because God's understanding, I guarantee you, is a much larger view than your understanding. And when I turn my will and my life over to God of its own understanding, I'm in a position of I don't know, and then I find out. Yeah? Because miracles start happening. Coincidences start happening. I start getting a whole new flavor of life downloading, yes? Like the one of the biggest flavors is you have it by giving it away. And if you've ever met a Coke dealer like that, he wasn't in the business long, yeah? He had it by giving away the Coke, you know? It didn't work out well. But in this state of mind, you have it by giving it away. Yeah? It's not about ownership or acquiring or attaining. It's about a surrender, an abandoning of all that. Yeah? And so that God of, my own, of, that own, of its own understanding downloads in your life. And I'll tell you, it's like either quickly or slowly, it starts pulling the tentacles off. And then you have a lot of free samples of what it's like to, and it, like this. You'll, you'll claim it. Oh, I'm, I'm really feeling great today. <laughs> oh, no, it doesn't work. And then, uh, the, oh, I'm really spiritual. No, that won't work. <laughs> because the movement of the selfing is the claim, yes? That's the dilemma. Like you and I, I you, I can't even take a shit when I want to. Literally. Sometimes. And sometimes when I don't want to, I have to take a shit. It's like incredible. But, and then when I take a shit and I look in the toilet, it's a logical idea. I did that. Yeah. You know, hey, I did that. But we're looking at thoughts all day, and we believe we're the thinker of the thoughts. It's un unbelievable. And then we think we can control our thoughts when we can't even control bowel movements. Yeah? I mean, the thoughts are much more subtle. You can't see them. You can't weigh them. There's an act, it's a process going on, but every thought that you see from the point of view of self is claimed as you as the thinker of it. Yeah? And every thought, if you, if a thought, its ability is to come and go, as soon as you put my on it, it's your thought. Yeah? Your thought. And then a lot of meaning gets downloaded into that thought that's yours. And you've got to do something with it. You gotta store it, you gotta dump it on somebody, you gotta act out somehow, you gotta hide it in the secret compartment, you gotta, you know, it's sort of like you're thinking you're spiritual and then you're doing porno at night, you know, I can't be talking about that to anyone. All this stuff starts happening, because it's, the thought has, what it does is it comes and goes, but your thought starts orbiting around the idea of you, yes? And it reinforces the planet Paul. And you think the thoughts are driving you crazy, but you're keeping them in that orbit. You're identified with what you're not, and it's keeping the thoughts about itself in orbit. And if you see it, if you look at um, another page in the book, I'm trying, just, I'm trying to go over all the old concepts here. <laughs> another page in the book is, it talks about a simple explanation why you're in fear. And it says it's because self-reliance has failed you. That's what it says, yeah. It says, why are you in so much fear today? And it doesn't let us answer. There's not like 50 blank pages for you to write out why. It says, isn't it because self-reliance has failed us? That's the simple explanation. So what is, what is the highest form of reliance on self is being identified as self? You can't rely on something more than that. You know what I mean? I mean, I relied on drugs, but I didn't become drugs. 
I mean, this is like a super reliance. So, what's causing the anxiety in my life is because there's a reliance on self, and it's an unreliable system. Yes? And if you notice, what you're calling fear really isn't fear, it's anxiety. Yeah? It's mental anxiety. A fear is a valid emotion that comes up when something threatens you now. But we're living under the threat of there and then all day. Yeah? Up in this little porno theater up here, yeah? up in this little porno theater, when you're up the ass of self, when you're up there, it's sort of like there's this manifest here, what's happening, yes? This is what's happening. Then there's a mental realm about what's happening. And in that mental realm, they have a here, just like this would be called here, yes? They have a here that has a vague look of this, but it's all about, all of, all of its content is there and then. It's all past and future. So while you're thinking you're here, you're really reacting to what's not here. And what I feel most addicts are trying to escape from is the mental here. They're taking it to be this here, but it isn't. It's the mental here. And you want to get out of here because it's not here. It's there and then. It's all old ideas and all worries about what could possibly happen. Yes? And so you want to escape here. What was unbelievable, I really wanted to escape here, and it ended up getting me imprisoned here, in the manifest here. <laughs> what a fucking trick. I was trying to get out of here, and I ended up going to jail and everything, and two years of, the, of uh, rehab, Delancey Street and all these places, yes? But the thing is, up here... The here is just the container for there and then, and most of our reaction here is to what's not happening. Literally. If you really looked at it, and you go over to someone's house and tell them what, why, what you're afraid of, they can't see it. Yeah? When you start describing it, well, why don't you just show it to me? You can't really show it to them, because it's not here. Yeah? It's there and then, yes? Your mind is... See, the mind takes you as a body in selfhood. It takes you as only a body, not, of a, not as a spirit, as a body. And then in that, what it does is it places you somewhere else as a body at some other time and thinks about it. Yeah? And when on, the only way the thought system that is running us sees you is as a body. When you think about you in the past, how do you think about you? As a body. When you're worrying about you in the future, how are you pictured in that future as a body? Yes? The thought system doesn't see you as spirit. It sees you as a body. Yeah? And to try to have that thought system take you to be a spirit, it'll take you to be a spiritual body. Yeah? It will always, the primary identification will be in place. It's sort of like trying to graft spirituality onto like a Teflon coating. It just doesn't work, does it? I mean, you practice and practice and practice, and then I drop the hat, and it gets all blown away. It's, it's, it's really not relied upon. And also, the higher power of your understanding is never there when you really need it. <laughs> It'll get you, like, parking spaces at meetings, and maybe a date, you know, a relationship for a month, maybe, or whatever. You won't flip out at the next picnic. But it's not going to bring you a radical sense of freedom. It can't. It can't deliver the goods. So, <laughs> so, in this thought system, what most of us are calling fear isn't fear because it's not happening here. It's a reaction to what's not happening. Now, what would be the solution to, a, to an anxiety that's produced in what's not happening? Maybe seeing it's not happening? What would happen if you saw it as not happening? Would its effects be able to last long? It really wouldn't. If you see it as what's not, if, if, if you see something that is actually not happening, its effects stop happening. <laughs> so, if you're in the manifest here, which you are, not in the mental here, yeah? if you're here, false evidence does not appear real here. False evidence appears false. In other words, it doesn't, it doesn't appear. Yeah? Here, false evidence appears real. Yes? That word, the acronym for fear. So false evidence is constantly appearing real, and then you're reacting to something that's false as if it's real. 
basically you're fucked. Yeah? You could be sitting here, and it could be a beautiful night, except for me talking, maybe. It could be a beautiful night, and yet you're not reacting to, you're not responding to here, you're reacting to what's not happening. You may be flipping out right now. No one else is flipping out, but you are. Because you're in your little own private Idaho. Yeah? You're just up there, and what's not happening? This is, that whole field of what's not happening opens up to you and appears real when you're identified as a self. Because the self only appears real in mind. There's no, there is no verification or, or evidence that there is a self in the living of life. There's just the living of life, yeah? So for me, with this information and then looking at the steps this way, I started to get a lot of different downloads. And some of them were written sort of about in the book, where you will cease fighting everyone and anything. Uh, you will be placed in a position of neutrality with no thought or effort on your part. The problem will not exist for you. Now that's a really high experience when the problem doesn't exist for you. But there, there is a state when the problem doesn't exist as you. Yeah? When the identification has been seen through, the problem will not exist as you, and that will be your basic state. It won't be an experience that comes and goes in more, anymore. You'll, that will be your like baseline, that the problem does not exist as you. Because that's actually how it exists. It doesn't exist for you, it exists as you. Then you start seeing, then in page 62, 63, they talk about it. You'll start learning, you'll be able to enjoy peace of mind. You'll feel a new, you'll feel a new power flowing in. You'll be able to face life successfully. You'll, sen you'll, you'll sense the presence of a higher power. That's an unbelievable state, yeah? But if you're present as a you, you can't sense the presence. Because you're what's present, yeah? The self is present. The self is present. When the self is constantly present, the higher power seems absent. It's only when the self is absent that the higher power is present. And I'm just telling, I'm just sharing with you, I believe the self is inherently absent as you. It's, there is not a you as a self. So if it is inherently absent, then the access point to the presence is always available at all times. You're in it right now. It's like here we are, we're like a, con like a convention of fish talking about the experience of water. <laughs> we're immersed in water. We're as wet as we'll ever be, but we're acting like we're dry. Trying to, I, I want to have an experience of being wet. <laughs> You're totally immersed in it. Yeah? And it doesn't dim or brighten in time. It's just on. Yeah? I feel it as a no-thingness. I don't know what, how to say it. But it's a sense of presence that I'll never know, because I'd have to be something else to know it. And I'm not, yeah? It's like the eye can never turn around and see itself. You're never going to know the truth, if you are the truth. Yeah? You're never going to have, you're never going to be able to cast the truth into an objective position so you, as a subject, can know it. All the truth is, is subjectivity. It's like here, every one of us, if you're looking my way, we'd say the same thing. I'm looking at you, yeah? Yes? Everyone sitting here, if you just describe what's happening, you would go, I'm looking at you. Yes? Everybody. I'm looking at you. Now, from this point of view, I'm looking at you. The yous are interchangeable, yeah? To, to this eye, where the eye's coming out of this position, and I mean I as spirit, I see you, yes? The eye from that position sees you. I, my mental process takes this you to be me. <laughs> I become identified as this, and then all the activities of this apparatus become special. I think they're unique and, un and not able to be understood by someone else. And yet if you come to enough AA meetings, you have to admit that a lot of people have your thoughts. <laughs> a lot of people have your feelings and a lot of people have your reactions to life I would imagine that maybe they're not yours yeah? maybe they're not your feelings maybe they're not your reactions maybe they're not your thoughts maybe what we really identify with others is not who they are but what's taking them over 
the same parasite took me over that took you over. And when we get into a room and start sharing about what it's like to be taken over, there's a sense of identification and commonality, and a lot of us can start laughing about it. Because why? That hopeless state of mind and body isn't hopeless anymore. There's something has happened. There's a shift. AA offered us a shift out of that possession. And so when we hear people sharing about what it was like to be possessed, it can be hilarious. But that, I tell you, if you ever remember when you were, doesn't it feel like a possession? If you've been sober for a little while and go out, I bet you it definitely feels like a possession. It's sort of like a horse in, a, in like a stable. And the horse has been ridden by a certain jockey. And maybe it gets a little relief, but when it sees that jockey coming, it's a little worried, yeah? That jockey's a nasty jockey. So it starts going, woo, 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 and the jockey starts talking to it. Oh, don't worry, it's going to be different this time. Don't worry. We're going to have a really nice ride. Yes, we're going to see beautiful vistas, and you're remembering this, woo, don't let this fucking thing get on you, yeah? But then it slips one leg over very easily. No, no, come on, keep down, don't bump, don't bump. And then as soon as it's on you, it stops trying to convince you it's talking as you now. Haven't you ever felt that? I've had it happen before 7-Eleven at 6 in the morning. I was thinking, should I fucking go in? I have 68 cents and get a pint or something. Or should I, should, maybe I shouldn't fucking do this. And it was like this little debate, yes? But as soon as, I, as soon as I drank, there was no more debate. As soon as I broke that little wall, I was not thinking when I went to the 7-Eleven, should I be doing this? I was doing it. Yeah? The thing takes you over. It's a possession. If it's a possession, it must be a foreign element. If it's a foreign element, we can be free of it. If we can look in and see, is it really the identification of self that is binding me to this idea of being this self? And if it is, yes, if it is and you're on the money, the bonding agent will weaken. And you'll start having different results. The stuff in the back of the book will become your own experience. You'll cease fighting everyone and anything for at least at times, very long periods of times. You will feel the presence of a higher power. Yeah? You'll you will enjoy peace of mind because mind is at peace, literally, and there's an enjoyment in it. But you can't stay there because if you're in this head, if you're even feeling peace now, you're thinking you won't be in a later. Yeah. In the mental here, there's no here. You can't enjoy peace of mind because it only happens here. In the mental here, there's all there and then. So even if you're having a really good time, you don't think you, it's going to last. How good a time is it? Yeah. If you're really having a good time, how long does it last for the head to start thinking it's not going to be good for long? Or I'm a fraud. Or when it, what's going to happen when they find out I don't deserve this? Yeah. Now, the same head, if you're having a bad time, what does it say? It's going to be a lifelong depression. So, when things are going good, it minimizes it. When things are going bad, it elongates it. Do you want your life to be dictated or interpreted by that? Do you want to live, even if you're sober, to fear that you won't be tomorrow every day? It even pisses on the, the, the parade of sobriety by having this constant fear. It says in the book, we're either cocky or arrogant or something, but it doesn't say how to stay sober every day is to be a f super afraid of not being sober. So, to me, sobriety is a freedom. Yeah? Freedom from what? Anxiety and fear. So I'm confident in my sobriety. I'm not worried I'm going to go drink tonight. I have a lot of respect for it, but I don't live in fear of it anymore because I've met a power greater than it. Yeah? And I, and that power greater than it, and the only thing, something that's addicted to power respects is a power greater than it. You're not going to therapize the parasite. You're not going to convince it to be nice. You're not. You've got an alcoholic parasite. Its characteristics has been written about. It's been shared at thousands of meetings over 70 years. There's been all these auxiliary books written about it. It's not changing its stripes. Yeah? The freedom is realizing you're not that, in my view. Yeah? And AA, to me, is like an incredible way to correct it when the vision goes off. Yeah? When, you, when the vision gets distorted again, you do service. Service will do what? Get you out of self. Yeah? Service is almost 100% guaranteed it will work. If you do service and help a newcomer or help someone or do an H&I, 
gospel and institution means it will take you out of wherever you think you're in, in a very short period of time. <laughs> yes? But those corrections are there so that the final, not let's say the final correction, but the baseline correction can occur, where you're actually inherently free, and every once in a while you may go off the rails. Instead of hoping to get on the rails, constantly afraid you won't. Yeah? So I don't know, I, um, I've been sober for a while, and this AA is my tribe, and it's sort of like this started coming over me, and I had a compulsion to share it. With the hopes that maybe this kind of view about what's happening may be more may be more suitable for you than the idea of it's an obsession with self that you constantly have to be vigilant your whole life and it's like uh, I have to join like an army to stay sober and I can't you know no to me this is like becoming a free range alcoholic yeah. <laughs> you get a life you don't have to stay in the coop all day you're running around and this and that. Yes? <laughs> I think that's the point to me, is, is freedom. Yeah? I have a lot of respect for what enables me and supports that freedom, but it's the utmost respect is the freedom. Yeah? And to me, that's what it is. The program allows you to access a power greater than it. We just had a talk where they were doing, uh, where I live, the fifth step, and the people were talking about being the sponsor or the one who did the fifth step, but no one brought the idea of God in. Yeah, and someone says, you really have to have, you've got to really be doing this, and you've got to have it to be able to listen to a fifth step. That's not my take. I say, if you open up to that power, yeah, I've heard some incredibly wise things coming out of newcomers' mouths, because they were willing to be, be in the position to be of service, and then what was needed for that service to occur came through. It's none of yours to have. We are just conveyors or conduits for it. Just like when we were the conduits for a parasite of alcoholism, we're the conduit for this other power. Yeah? We're not what that parasite uh, expressed or delivered through us, and we're also not that. We are we're just a conduit. And all the power is available if you just have an access point. But if you try to access it as self, it defeats it right at the beginning. Because now you think you're spiritual. Now you think you have something that others don't. Yeah? And as soon as you own it and privatize it and claim it, you've lost the spirit of it. It's like nudity. Yeah? So, what else can I do up here? No? I think that's it. Any questions? <laughs> When I used to shoot coke, I used to, uh, there would be points when I was leaving the body and all I needed was someone to put their hand on my shoulder and it would keep me here. It almost gets like that with these talks. <laughs> I, I'm at the point of leaving at every, every second. <laughs> no questions? No? Yes? When you, when you started to first receive these downloads, State that you talk about when you shared it in the open meeting, did you ever catch some criticism for that? Yes. <laughs> I'll probably catch some unspoken criticism tonight. Who no. knows? Yes, I seem to attract the criticism. Yeah. There's one statement in AA I don't like is that it's not AA. I don't like that statement because it can be a deterrent to learning other things. Yeah? Yes, a lot of criticism. Yeah, Amy was witnessing it. We had a, every Monday night we had a meeting, and there was a whole lot of criticism being served there. You know. Anyone else? Yes. We were talking about this. Excuse my language. Brain fuck that's going on. Do you ever differentiate between like an emotional and an intellectual state, and how like one might have a little more space in you than others? Yes, other definitely, okay. definitely. The emo but the emotional state is very, very uh, affected by the thought system. Yes. Because the thought system gives meaning to everything. The emotion steers it. Well, no, the emotion is there to be, and then this, the thought system sees it as an opportunity to use it. In other words, it uses it usually to reinforce its storyline. Yeah, yeah. The whole idea of the selfing is it's a, like a parasitical movement. It claims, yes? Whatever it comes in contact with, it uses it for the infection in a way. Yeah. So 
instead of seeing like life is happening, you see it as it's happening to me. It's this incredible self-centered sucking vacuum. Yeah? And to see life as just happening is a nice way to go. When it's happening to you, it can get really heavy. <laughs> really heavy. Because when you see life's happening, you see it as happening. When you see life's happening to you, you don't think it should be happening. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have an opinion about it shouldn't be happening. So there's an immediate denial of the fact it happened with the should it shouldn't have happened. Where it's always wise, I feel, is to acknowledge actually what's happening. Yeah? And then take it from there. But the mental system denies what's happening quite a lot. So it doesn't even have conscious contact. doesn't even allow that to have any effect. It denies it. I don't want this to be happening. And then it goes in up here. And then it starts writing tons of stories. <laughs> and then shit. I mean, watch it. It's, it's all there to see. Because you're conscious and I'm conscious. You can see it. Yeah? We become unconscious when we're taking ourselves to be seen from it. But you can see self in it. And if you can see it, it's not you. If whatever you can see is not you. Yeah? So, any quick more? No? You know, it, it's funny because you're talking like that, and, and I'm sitting here thinking about the selfing, and of course, in thinking about the selfing, I'm selfing as well. Yeah. And well, so, you're not selfing. That's just selfing. Well, the, you know, well, that's true. That's true. The selfing is happening in there, and, and then I have to catch myself, and it's, it's like, you know, it's like a constant battle to stop this thing from happening. But maybe you don't have to catch yourself. Yeah, if you don't see it as you, <laughs> let it go. Let it go wherever it wants. What it wants, you get, will always look back to make sure it has your attention and interest. If it doesn't have your attention and interest, it fucking, oh, it just humbly crawls back. Uh, oh, yeah, watch it. Watch it. Yeah. Seriously. It's all there to get attention and interest. And it knows that the attention and interest of where you are will go to whatever you believe to be you. If you take yourself to be self, you're going to have tons of interest in the mental system about you. <coughs> Obviously, yeah. If you see that you may not be that, when you lose interest in the mental system, there is a freedom inherently in that. When thoughts don't mean so much to you anymore, and you start getting navigated by something other than a thought system, yeah, because there are other systems to contact. Mind is like a like a receiver. It can contact other stations than K-Paul all day. Yeah, it can pick up other stations. And some of those stations don't have self as their center. They don't. So you get some different information and in downloads, and it, now it uh, translates here. You know, you, it shows up in your life, how you're traveling through things. Yeah? And then that verifies you're on to something, because the proof is in the pudding. The greatest solution to dissatisfaction is satisfaction. If there's a sense of being satisfied, it chills out a lot of shit. Yeah? Because the self is constantly looking, seeking, 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 seeking. Constantly. Even let's say you meet a girlfriend, it suddenly, as soon as she becomes your girlfriend, the next day you think you gotta find another girlfriend. It's all, uh, that's, oh, that's just my girlfriend. I'm looking for a girlfriend. But you have a girlfriend. No, I'm looking for a girlfriend. That's what you're actually having, is looking. Looking for something. Yeah? It's not about finding at all. You think it is. That's why it keeps you looking. <laughs> it keeps telling you, oh, I'll be so happy when I get there. You're never happy when you get there. Every here, every mythical there turns out to be a here. Yeah. When you get what you think you were working towards, you get there, it doesn't work the magic trick. So now that becomes a here, and now you're looking for the mythical there again. You're like, a, you're like in slavery. Check it out. Yeah. So like being stuck in the anticipation, the expectation, and basically not getting anywhere? Is that more or less what you're saying? I'm saying that's, that's an aspect of it. That's an aspect. Yes. That's just one of its many manifestations. Like it says in the inventory process, we're looking at just some of its common manifestations. There's a lot of manifestations of selfing. A lot of them. If you look in the dictionary, look up the word self, and there'll be a hyphen, and there'll be like 95 descriptions. I mean, that's just one, that's just a little bit of the picture. Yeah? See it. Self-defeat, self-love. There's, there's about 10% nice ones and 90% not nice ones. 
Most of them were like self-sabotage, self-destruction, self-hate, self you know what I mean? Then they know it's self-love and self-compassion. So I, I once looked at it, I think 80 to 10 were, 80 were nasty, 10 were pretty good. You know, it's like living like this. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I just hope it's going to get better. <laughs> That's what it lives on. Have you ever asked it to deliver the goods now? It just gives you Stalinist five-year plans. Yeah? All right, go back to school, do this, get married, have a kid. All right, what will happen then? You'll be happy, joyous, and free. How about I get that shipment now? Oh, no, sorry. No. There's, none, there's none in the factory right now. We have to order that. It's a special order. We'll get back to you with another plan. Yeah. Any system that has excuses, rationalization, and blame as one of its basics is a failed system. It's like if somebody always delivered the couch when they said they would need no excuses, no rationalizations, and no blame. It's a system that fails that uses that activity. And this uses it quite a lot. Most of its whole mo movement is blaming, rationalizing, and excusing. Yeah? It's a failed system. If there's a continual reliance on it, your life is going to fail. Like it says, a li any life run on self-will will not be successful. Yeah? He didn't say e your life. He said any life. Any life run on self-will is probably not going to be successful on a certain level. Maybe you'll have everything you thought you wanted, but there may be a big emptiness inside of you. This way, I believe it's really important to get a clear idea of what you're suffering from. And then if it is a thing of powerlessness, which it is, we're powerless over this.